Today we're going to be learning a new application and the purpose of learning this application will be to deepen our understanding of shear stress and shear, shear strain. So we're going to be looking at what's called the pure torsion of a circular bar. Pure torsion of a circular bar. Remember, whenever we do a new application, we do three steps. First one is we look at the geometry of the object or the kinematics. The next one, this, this first step doesn't have anything to do with loads. Then we look at the constitutive behavior, which is the material. And then we look at equilibrium, which is how internal and external forces relate. And so we did this for a bar in tension and compression. And so now we're going to do this for torsion. But I hope you can see that there is a close relationship to what we've done in the past. OK, so let's draw our model. We're going to have a bar, circular cross-section, prismatic cross-sectional area. There's going to be a torsional load, which is denoted by this arrow with two, uh, with this double-headed arrow. And this is going to be a torsion of magnitude t. And the torsion basically is a force that's applied kind of like a moment. So you use the right-hand rule, your thumb points in the direction of the arrow, and then that tells you the direction of this applied moment. This torsional load is going to act through the centroid of the bar, which, and if we assume, we're going to assume that this is kind of, in some sense, fixed on this end. And so we're applying a torsion. And as you would expect, if you drew a line, if you inscribed a line, you would expect after the application of the load that there would be the development of an angle here where this here is going to be called phi of x, okay, and then the total amount of um, twist we're going to call phi, where this is the total total angle of twist. Okay, and that makes sense. We're applying a torsion, you expect there to be a twisting of the bar. We're going to measure that twisting with this function phi of x, where x is the coordinate that runs in that direction. OK, now, just as before, if we drew a graph of phi of x, then we know that it's 0 at the left endpoint, and we know that it's equal to phi at the right endpoint. And the question is, is how do we connect the dots? Well, the small deformations, we're just going to connect the dots with a line. And so just as before, if we look at the slope of that line, d phi dx, it's constant and it's just phi over L, where L is the total length of the bar. So you should notice this is very similar to what we did for uh, elongation and uh, tension and compression of an axial bar. And we're going to call this, um, we're going to call this theta, and it's going to have a name. It's going to be, as you would expect, the rate of twist. Right. Rate of change of the angle of twist with respect to x is going to be called theta, the rate of twist. Okay, so now remember, we're, we're working on step one, which is the geometry or the kinematics. So what we're really after is an appropriate measure of strain. Okay, this is an appropriate measure for change in angle, but what we really want is a change of length over length. So let's talk about how we develop what we would call strain. And in this case, all strain is going to be shear strain because of how the load is applied. So we want to look at how is shear strain defined. So let's take a little cut out of here. Okay, So we're going to take a little slice 
of that cross section and let's blow it up and take a careful look at it. Okay, so we have our portion of the bar dx. Then we've got this um, angle here, which is going to be d phi. And what we want is this amount of strain, right? How much does this point move to this point? Right? And we'll call this d delta. Okay, So that's the small increment of elongation in the direction of twist. Okay, now if you recall for an recall for an axial bar, so if we recall for an axial bar, remember that epsilon for an axial bar was d delta dx. And so that's the same idea that we have here. So what we really need to figure out is what is d delta in terms of phi the angle of twist. Okay. So if you look at the geometry of this triangle here, okay, we can relate d phi to d delta through triangles, through right triangle manipulations, and that's going to give us tangent of d phi is equal to d delta over r, where r is the radius of the cross section. Okay, and so then this it implies that d delta is r d phi. Okay, so now we have an idea of what d delta is. Remember the tangent goes away because small angles, we have small angles, so we can ignore the the tangent. And now we can see that we have a correct measure for d delta. Okay, so we can take this d delta here, plug it in here, which gives us epsilon is equal to um, r d phi dx. And this isn't a normal strain, so we're not going to use this particular symbol. Let's use this symbol here, gamma, because this is going to be a shear strain. Okay, we always use gamma for shear strain. Okay, so gamma is equal to r d phi dx, okay, and d phi dx is equal to the rate of twist, so this is just gamma is equal to r Okay, now that is the shear strain on this outer surface. Okay, this is gamma is what's happening on this outer surface. And you can see that because phi starts from zero here, right, and gets bigger as you move out, right, the angle, um, you can see that this is going to be the maximum gamma that we find. Okay, because R is at a maximum value. Now let's say we wanted to measure the strain, let's say right at this point where this was rho. Okay, then all we would do is take r and replace it by rho. Okay, so gamma changes linearly from zero in the center to its maximum value on the outer surface of the bar. Okay, so just to review, the important ideas here are we have this thing called phi of x, an angle of twist, okay, angle of twist. As always, we look at the rate, so we look at d phi dx, we say that's equal to what we call theta, that's called the rate of twist. And since the slope is constant, 
the rate of twist is nothing more than equal to phi over L. Okay, and then our strain, okay, our strain, okay, is the strain along these kind of outer surfaces moving into the center. Those are the strains, and we call that gamma equal to rho theta, where rho is some distance that we're measuring, right? Rho goes from 0 to r. So any value between 0 and r we can plug in for rho, and that will give us our notion of the shear strain. Okay, so this is, we're now done with step one, the kinematics or the geometry of the motion. So step two, if you recall, is the constitutive modeling. And so here, we're just going to do Hooke's law because we have small deformations. Okay, so Hooke's law. And in this case, it's what we've already learned. It's the tau, the shear stress, is going to be nothing more than the shear modulus of elasticity times gamma. So we've already learned this. So there's nothing new here at all. So if you look at the cross-section, Tau, this force, starts at zero, because gamma is zero, the shear strain is zero at the center of the cross-section, and as you move out, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's going to vary linearly. Okay, so this is how tau changes as you move from the inside point to the outside. Okay, so that's the constitutive modeling, and so now the last step is... equilibrium. Okay, how does, how do the internal shear stresses relate to the applied torsional load? That's what we need to work on now. Okay, so if we look at our cross section here, maybe it goes to say we go some distance rho, Total distance is all as usual. It's going to be our radius r. Okay. Now let's take a little differential area element. Okay. Let's say we take a little element here, d a. Okay. A differential area element. And we know that there is a force acting over d a equal to the shear stress. Right. So the shear stress. Acting is acting over the surface of this differential area element dA. Okay, and this tau dA, right, tau dA is nothing more than a resultant force. A resultant force. Okay, all right. So if we want to know the total force acting on this cross-section, we take all of these little differential area elements, multiply them by the appropriate tau to get a resultant force, and add them all up. And we do that as usual with integrals. Okay. So if we want a small change in the moment, right? because these forces we would call them moments by the way that they're acting, it's going to be equal to force times distance okay that's how you that's what a moment is so in this case what's the force the force is tau da there's our resultant force and what's the moment arm well the distance is going to simply be the distance rho Now, since um, tau, okay, so here's tau, since tau is equal to rho over r tau max, right? So the maximum is the shear stress on the outer surface of the circular bar. And so if we're on the interior of the bar, we just simply scale tau max by the distance rho over r, where, where rho is going from 0 to r. Okay. 
Since this is true, we can replace tau with this expression, which gives us the following, that dm is equal to tau max over r rho squared dA. Okay, now, equilibrium says that the applied external load T, okay, the torque, must be equal to over the cross section A, all the little differential moments. If you add them all up, it better be exactly equal to the applied external moment we're calling the torque. Okay, and we have dm here, so we can take dm and plug it in. It gives us tau max, because that's constant for the cross section, over r rho squared dA. But notice that this is nothing more than the polar moment of inertia of the cross section. So we end up with tau max over r i sub rho. Okay. okay, so that's that's an important equation. So T, the external load, is related to tau max through the polar moment of inertia. Okay, and so we're gonna let's go ahead and rearrange this a little bit so that we can get tau max on the left side. So tau max is equal to T R over I sub rho. Okay. And then if we want any tau, right, this is the maximum tau on the external surface. If we want any tau, then we re simply replace R with rho. T rho. Now this is the distance from the center to some location on the cross-section over I sub rho. Okay, and this, is, this has a name. This is called the torsion formula. Okay, but don't be fooled. This is nothing more than equilibrium. This is nothing more than equilibrium. So just as before, we've gone through the three steps. Kinematics, or the geometry of the motion, ignoring loads, the constitutive of the modeling, and then finally the equilibrium. So just as we did before, except now the geometry of the problem is slightly different. And so um, the way we measure the internal force is slightly different. And in this case, rather than normal stress, we're looking at shear stress.